Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, I totally appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, and be part of this webinar. So I'm going to talk about robotic embolization and uh, basically real-world experiences that we've had with uh, the Hansen, Hansen Magellan uh, robotic system. Okay, let me go to the next slide. So uh, when we were trying to make the decision about uh, why we would want to integrate robotics into our interventional radiology practice, I think uh, the first uh, premise was that we know as a practice we wanted to be, in, we had a philosophy of being involved in cutting edge, minimally invasive therapies. Uh, and we found this to be a new technology that was very exciting. And then we thought about uh, the fact that we'd all had complex cases uh, that we did during our career which could involve increased procedure time, uh, there's increased radiation to the patient, to the staff, and to the physicians, especially when you're doing multiple complex uh, procedures during the course of the day or certainly a career. Uh, and then there were those cases where multiple catheters and wires were uh, required to either successfully catheterize an artery or when you've catheterized that artery to maintain stable position if you're going to deliver therapy, be it embolization or revascularization. And this could be because of tortuosity in the vessel or different vessel angles. In addition, we all realize that there's technical failures that we had with our primary access and we may need to perform multiple accesses to accomplish our procedure. Or even as uh, Dr. Katzen mentioned, there's cases where you have to bring the patient back and perform a second procedure. And we also realize that with different uh, people and different training programs, all different specialties, there's a lot of discrepancies in uh, training and the skill set of uh, interventional radiologists and even other endovascular physicians. So again, why we wanted to integrate uh, robotics into our practice is to reduce this unpredictability. Uh, we wanted to keep our cost down of the equipment going to multiple catheters, wires, and, and devices sometimes that we'd open, which we were unable to deliver. Uh, and then we wanted to reduce any inefficiencies or overruns in our lab and, and obviously reduce complications. And we knew that we all had cases just like this where no matter what you did in, in this uterine fiber and embolization procedure, you just couldn't get uh, your uh, five French catheter or any other catheter despite multiple catheters or even your micro catheters and wires to get into this uterine artery uh, when it's typically very easy to do so. And no matter what you did, uh, it was a very complex procedure. Uh, in addition, you had these aortic arches, which uh, were very complex aortic arches if you're going to be doing, uh, as in this case, a uh, right carotid uh, artery stenting procedure where the angles to achieve what you need to to get your catheter and then ultimately your stent into the artery could be quite complex. Um, and lastly, we felt, you know, we're, we're very aware that interventional radiologists now who are, who are even busier uh, receive high radiation doses, and radiation exposure is both cumulative and the effects are permanent. Uh, we are concerned about radiation-induced cataracts. The SIR has had a mission uh, to look at this among interventional radiologists, and also we're worried about occupational malignancy. And certainly uh, from all these uh, procedures wearing lead and standing for long periods of time in complex cases uh, that we'd be at risk for uh, orthopedic complications. So what we did is we worked with our hospital administration in ANOVA and we obtained the Magellan robotic system at the end of uh, October 2014, so just about six months ago. Uh, we decided to set up a week of training and it was important for us to get all of our technical staff trained on this, our technologists and nurses. And uh, we have seven interventional radiologists in our practice, and we wanted uh, many of them to get trained because all of us brought different subspecialties, even within the field of interventional radiology, uh, to the table. And it was important for us to get everybody trained to see where they might uh, use the robotic system uh, for their individual subspecialization. So, there's both, as you heard, the nine French and the six French system. There are actually two separate trainings for this, and, and that's why we dedicated the week for this. And, and we went through the two discrete training sessions, which included didactics, uh, lessons for both the physicians and the staff on prepping and draping. And then there's model training, and I'll show you that in a little bit. And then uh, we set up cases uh, at the end of the week to actually do live cases with patients. 
We learned uh, a variety of troubleshooting tips as with uh, any new technology. And then Hansen uh, representatives were there during the whole week uh, to sign off on uh, the physicians who completed the training. And so the next part was to figure out, okay, which room are we going to put this in and, and, and how are we going to orient this uh, in our room? And obviously you have to worry about both the, the robotic arm itself, which is table mounted uh, to the side, usually on the left side of the table. Uh, from the patient's side and then there's the uh, workstation that's going to be in the room and, and if we're going to achieve many of the benefits we're going to want to put this away from obviously the table in, in a good place. So this is our room. We've decided to put this in uh, one of our interventional radiology rooms and here's the robotic system that's actually draped for a patient. You can see that there's um, your regular monitor system uh, that's on the left and then there's the one that comes with the Hansen system on the right and you can use both depending on where you're standing for the procedure and there's also a monitor system at the workstation and then uh, this shows with the uh, robotic system set up for one of our procedures uh, how it looks at the end of the table and here with the catheter system in place and, and ready to drive for this uh, fibroid embolization case and then this is over in the corner of the room uh, the workstation and uh, here we're using, uh, for this procedure, we're a step further away from uh, the in image intensifier from the flat panel that's uh, on top of the patient and we're at the end of the table. So even doing this, we're eliminating uh, radiation because there's a table side control that we could use if we so desire. And in our early experience, we decided that this was advantageous, so we weren't taking, on our, taking off our gowns and putting them back on multiple times during the procedure. But then as we got more comfortable, we went over to the workstation, and you could see from this perspective, uh, we have a lead shield wall here. Uh, the staff are monitoring everything uh, that, that all is okay with the robotic arm and everything's moving as we want to, and uh, the physician is uh, further away from uh, the radiation performing the procedure. And as I mentioned before, sometimes it could take a variety of catheters to get what you need to accomplish uh, for the procedure. And really with the either nine French system with or without the leader catheter and the six French system, uh, you can achieve really any of these shapes as Dr. Katzen had shown in the earlier um, presentation. And so here's the flow model that is in place, which uh, you can see is set up to uh, handle a variety of catheterizations on the left. And here we're using the robotic arm from the workstation to basically train. And this we had access to both during the week and after the week of training if we wanted to perfect our, our techniques, um, not on like patients and here you're seeing a, an image of catheterizing what would look like a right renal and a left renal artery and then here a superior mesenteric artery and then as we got more experience with the six French system into uh, internal iliac artery branches and you'll see here I have some examples of fluoroscopic um, images of driving the robot in the model here catheterizing from an ipsilateral approach uh, the internal iliac artery and you could see we could advance and maintain a stable position if you're going to perform any uh, embolization procedures in this case uh, we were trying to simulate also going over the aortic uh, bifurcation uh, into the contralateral iliac artery and really using uh, the robot to turn twist and and go over the uh, bifurcation So uh, what is our current status? We've performed both nine and six French cases. Here's our list of cases. Uh, be, usually the nine French case, you're going to do revascularization procedures as uh, described here, iliac artery revascularization, carotid artery stenting, mesenteric artery stenting. And then with the six French device, we performed uh, usually a variety of uh, embolizations and one interesting pulmonary artery thrombolysis case that I'll show you in a second. Um, so there's certainly a learning curve and, and that's what I think the model is very helpful for and things that you need to think about when you're using the device. So one, for the nine French uh, system, if you're performing a lot of uh, iliac revascularization procedures now or contralateral femoral revascularization procedures, usually you're using six French axes. So with the nine French uh, system, you're going to need a, a nine or ten French sheath. We use a nine French sheath. You're going to be using closure devices. Uh, and you need to learn when you're going to manipulate both the guide catheter and then the leader catheter and the wire. And that's totally a learning curve that, uh, you know, when do you bend, rotate, and advance. 
And what we learned is, I, I think one of the concerns is with using the robotic system is that you would feel that you lose your tactile feel of the vessel. But what you really learn is even when you're using a manual catheterization, this is mostly, mostly a visual feel uh, when you're looking at what you're doing. You're not necessarily always feeling the uh, vessel um, as you're catheterizing a normal vessel. And certainly with the six French, again, uh, the learning curve is when to use the leader catheter and when not to use the leader catheter. And we find that we'll frequently not use the leader catheter and we'll use the six French guide to really bend into a lot of the positions we need to get to. Uh, we can perform road mapping uh, through the uh, guide catheter uh, with the wire in place. And then we'll figure out when we're using the leader and when we're going to go right to a micro catheter. So I have a few case examples I'll show you from our practice. Uh, here's a 73-year-old woman presented with uh, mid-epigastric pain. She had a history of cholecystectomy in the past. And uh, in her workup, she was found to have a 3.5-centimeter uh, visceral artery aneurysm. And again, with her symptoms of abdominal pain, here's her non-contrast CAT scan demonstrating uh, what at the time was felt to be a gastroduodenal artery aneurysm. And here with the six French guide in place, really just rotating it using your anatomic landmarks uh, pointed right uh, at the junction for the superior mesenteric and celiac axis and doing a nice angiogram through that uh, guide catheter. And then using the robotic uh, system to drive right into the superior mesenteric. And as you can see in this case, we're dealing with a replaced uh, common hepatic artery aneurysm. And then we use the leader catheter uh, to go up into the distal portion of the common um, hepatic artery, perform angiography, and then, as you can see here, really mapping things out, and then performing coil embolization of both the uh, vessel and uh, the aneurysm while maintaining a very stable position with the guide catheter. And uh, this patient went on to a very successful uh, hepatic artery aneurysm embolization. Next is a patient who had a history of uh, pulmonary embolism and presented with a recurrent submassive pulmonary embolism. The patient was treated a couple years earlier with uh, uh, ultrasound-assisted catheter-directed thrombolysis. And, and what the operators uh, mentioned was that it was really difficult navigating through the right heart. Uh, in that it was very uh, big and boggy, uh, probably more chronically as the patient had a history of chronic uh, pulmonary hypertension. But the plan in this case with this very symptomatic patient was to perform repeat uh, ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis. And you can see here from the CT angiogram, large pulmonary embolism in the right main pulmonary artery. And, and obviously the indication here being that the RVLV ratio is so significantly uh, increased with the patient with a significant degree of right heart dysfunction. And here coming up from the femoral vein approach, uh, driving the robotic arm directly into the right atrium. And then you'll see on the next, uh, really very easily navigating through the right ventricle and into the pulmonary outflow tract. Uh, you'll see how easy it is. And these were almost real-time pictures where uh, we were able to drive then directly into the right pulmonary artery uh, to ultimately deliver our therapy and navigate into the branch of the pulmonary artery that we wanted to uh, and then pull the um, guide back and then we could advance our, in this case, ECHOS catheter directly into the pulmonary artery where we're going to perform the procedure and again have that stability of the guide in place. And then this is the 48-hour follow, 48 follow-up CT, which you see a resolution of the pulmonary embolism and uh, more normalization of the RBLB ratio. Next is a uterine fibroid embolization patient. This is a patient who had two prior myomectomies, and interestingly enough, one was done uh, robotically assisted uh, a year prior, and the patient was actually referred for our uh, robotic uh, assisted uterine artery embolization procedure. And you can see here large, despite the two myomectomy surgeries, large uh, uterine fibroids in the uh, coronal and sagittal um, MRI. And then I'll take you right through the procedure where very easily using the six French system, driving over the aortic bifurcation into the um, hypogastric artery where we can do nice arteriography through a hand injection and you see this nice size uterine artery. So this seemed like a great case to use the leader catheter to perform our target therapy of the embolization through, which is in fact what we did. So advancing that wire and just navigating that leader catheter in place and having nice flow into the uterine artery and then performing the embolization. And that's the post-embolization run on the left. 
and then similarly doing the same thing with the same catheter to treat the right uterine artery and, and navigating right into the right uterine artery as you can see we're doing here and then with the leader catheter in place performing a successful embolization and this is the final aortogram which demonstrated occlusion of both uterine arteries. So again one of the reasons to use this is catheter stability and as you can see here with the TACE case a very uh, complex uh, celiac artery uh, origin to perform this uh, TACE procedure and then with the six French system you can really straighten things out, still have flow uh, and have a stable catheter position to perform the embolization and then as uh, Dr. Katzen described before the direct catheterization of the vessel instead of scraping along the wall and you can see here with the aortic arch you really hate to scrape along the wall of the uh, aortic arch in this place as opposed to just navigating uh, the catheter directly into the left carotid artery uh, to perform both the arteriography and then ultimately the stenting procedure. So I want to get to uh, the big issue of radiation reduction which I think is something that you'll be hearing more and more about uh, and this is actually courtesy of Dr. Uh, Sandeep Rao in El Paso, Texas who performed 10 taste procedures and he used the RaySafe I2 active dosimetry system to look at intraprocedural radiation exposure to both the operator, the technologist, the additional support staff and uh, at the control side, uh, where, at the bedside where the uh, table side controls are. And this is an example of the RaySafe. There's all these dosimeters which give you direct feedback uh, during the procedure of what the radiation exposure is to. And what they found is uh, in these 10 cases, the radiation dose to the operator significantly decreased over time. And you'll see they work from the independent workstation for the last seven cases where you can see the radiation dose to the physician is, is markedly reduced uh, down to a 5.2 um, on that last case. And then if you look at the bedside control, what you're getting, uh, and this is when you're doing your typical procedure, you're standing uh, by the patient, and in their 10 cases, the average radiation was uh, 220 millirem, uh, but to the operator uh, on these cases working from the remote station, uh, it was an average of 8.1 and as I said before this is when working from the remote uh, workstation uh, how significantly reduced the radiation exposure is. So in summary obviously you can see there's many potential roles for use of the catheter robotic system. Uh, there's a potential for increased uh, predictability of doing the procedure, increased stabilization, de decreased catheter exchanges in the complex cases and decreased uh, radiation exposure for the operators. Uh, so thank you very much and uh,